Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. I can't lie to y'all. I had less than low expectations for the third entry in the Fly series, Curse of the Fly. These low expectations stem from the underwhelming Return of the Fly, which was an inferior retreading of the original, paired with lackluster practical effects and makeup, which, you know, is kind of the entire draw of these films. But even before approaching Curse of the Fly, the third and final film in the original trilogy, it had a number of things working against it. For starters, the series would lose its star power of Vincent Price, who was unable to be in the film due to him being under contract with a rival studio, American International Pictures. The film was also the notorious bomb of the series due to the realization that it doesn't actually feature a fly. My god, long before Halloween 3 or Friday the 13th Part 5, audiences would cry foul at a horror film losing its titlier monster. But is this an example of marketing bait and switch? Or is this radical series development on a tiresome approach the breath of fresh air the series needed? Let's find out. Directed by Hammer Horror alum Don Sharp and written by Harry Spaulding, 1965's Curse of the Fly evolved on the concept that the real monster of the series was never actually a fly, but man himself. There are few direct narrative connections to the previous two films other than the Delambre family continues to struggle with the family curse, their unwavering dedication to trying to tame the technology that's haunted their family for years. We meet Martin Delambre, played by George Baker, the grandson of the original Fly, who while out driving one night stumbles upon a scantily clad woman running in the road. He offers Patricia, played by Carol Gray, a ride into the city and the two begin a rather fast romantic relationship. Though is usually the case with starstruck lovers both harbor secretive pasts. Patricia has escaped from a psychiatric facility for an undisclosed condition, while Martin suffers from recessive fly genes that cause him to age rapidly if he doesn't frequently administer an antidote. This powder keg of secrets is lit once Patricia learns of Martin and his father Henry have continued to pursue their family's work with teleportation. The results of which have been catastrophic to say the least. As the authorities begin closing in on Patricia's location, the Delambre clan must conceal their work and the dastardly ramifications that are housed within their property. If Curse of the Fly has one thing working in its favor, it's that the film has a far more engaging narrative despite its focus shifting from a literal fly monster. Digging deep into the idea of family legacy and the metaphorical curse that the Delambres suffer from, an unwavering dedication to continuing their experiments, even if in the end it means the death of them, and others. This new narrative angle works well for the final film in the trilogy as it turns the lens towards the mad scientists as it were, rather than focusing on the monsters they create. The family flaw has always been the true monster of the series as the flaws in people are ultimately more terrifying given how grounded and believable they are. The Delambre's insatiable appetite will ultimately lead to their destruction, whether or not they realize or even care at this point. Despite it bombing at the box office, Curse of the Fly seems like a film that audiences simply were not ready for in 1965. Granted, the marketing indicated more of the atomic fear-stoking monstrosity that had become synonymous with the series, but the man is the true monster concept isn't something that people were expecting, and as we all know, general audiences more or less hate surprises. Furthermore, I found this film to be far more disturbing than the previous ones, given the hellish abominations it has in store for the audience. Rather than a fly, we see the Delambre's numerous failed teleportation test subjects, which they store in stables on the house grounds. The practical and makeup work here isn't as strong as that of the original fly, but pairing the sinister reality of the family and the variety of horrific mutations their subjects have endured, it makes for a far darker film than I was anticipating especially compared to the previous film. For as strong as Curse of the Fly's narrative is, it's slightly undercut by some hammy writing and a series of goofy moments focusing on Martin and Patricia's relationship. The star-crossed lover's angle feels overly forced to the degree that I was in danger of having my eyes roll into the back of my head. There is also a subplot where the Delambre housekeepers attempt to turn the family against Patricia. 
Using her history of mental illness against her, which ultimately works better on paper than it is executed on in the film. And while the film isn't entirely marred by this, it's a hiccup in an otherwise solid follow-up to the original. Curse of the Fly is probably the biggest surprise of the series thus far, as I was expecting a dumpster fire of unimaginable proportions. No fly? How the hell could that possibly be entertaining? No Vincent Price? Say it ain't so. Alas, despite the dismissal of these series standbys, Don Sharp and Harry Spaulding isolate a far more intriguing angle to continue the story of the cursed Delambre family. The film actively defies the bigger and better ethos of the sequels in favor of turning the fly experience on his head, yielding one of the most creative and sinister entries in the franchise yet. Curse of the Fly marked the end of the original trilogy, and we wouldn't see another fly film for 21 years. But then in 1986, the king of body horror himself, David Cronenberg, would craft not only a remake of the original film, but insert one of the best love stories of all time into it. You know, on top of his masterful knack for goopy body horror. So be on the lookout for my review of Cronenberg's The Fly next week. And that'll do it for part three of my series review of The Fly. I'll see you guys tomorrow for another daily horror movie review. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service and follow at Daily Horror Habit on Instagram and at Daily Horror Pod on Twitter.